everyone, I am Natalia Bilbao, and here's what's happening in LA this week. Tommy's Field provides new green space and gives children of all sporting abilities a place to call their own. Mayor Karen Baz joined LA Galaxy and Vista Del Mar at the opening of this new place, which honors the spirit of play. We're at Vista unveiling a beautiful new artificial soccer pitch for the community. This is important because Los Angeles needs more safe places for, for children to play. So we're fortunate enough on Vista here that they were able to uh, allow us to build a brand new soccer field. It is a wonderful way to begin a day, to have a family come together and gather the resources to create a field like this so that children in our community, and especially children who are struggling, have access to recreation, I think it's critically important. What happened was, when our son Tommy passed five years ago, he always would see the field at Westwood Rec Center and it was, it was gone to seed. Nobody used it anymore. It was just all mud and weed. And he used to say, I need a field in my neighborhood. So his passing became our impetus to create a foundation, raise money and build a proper field. So we did that. We, we raised the money and we built a Tommy's field and it received some press because surprisingly it had some couple of neighbors and local activists thought they didn't want a field there for kids to play on. You figure it out. Uh, and in reading about it, Vista Del Mar said, we love the whole concept of Tommy's Field and come visit us and we want one here. So my wife and I visited and before we were halfway through our tour, we were in tears and said, Tommy needs a second field for those kids. And today was the grand opening. We're here today celebrating. Uh, we're going to do some youth clinics here. Uh, Galaxy Star Squad's here with their inflatable. We have our, our mascot, Cosmo. So for today, we're, we're really enjoying the day, the sunshine. And, uh, and here's my friend Cosmo. Hello. Our kids need to set their devices aside. They need to be active physically. It's important for your mental health, your physical health, and your overall development. Yeah, Tommy, our son, had the spirit of play. So he was about singing, dancing, and playing his whole life, and it was infectious. And so what this is for is so that kids play. That's what we need to do. As the mayor said, get off your devices and just go run. Now the city's been in touch with us about possibly creating more Tommy's Fields for the city. Nikki and, and Doug Mark had done a lot of really good work uh, in memory of their son uh, to put in this pitch in his name. Uh, what resonates me the most is uh, really how sports impacts the community and, and how it really brings cities and cultures together uh, to really give back. And, and that for me is the most meaningful thing. Did you know Los Angeles Police Department can help in the prevention of catalytic converter thefts? LAPD hosts free pop-up events where they will etch and mark catalytic converters to deter thieves. We caught up with LAPD Northeast at a community event. Take a look. We're here today as one of our monthly community events. This is going to be our VIN etching and marking event. We etch our vehicles, we mark these vehicles, and we also provide information as to anti-theft. What can people do to prevent them from being a victim of catalytic converter theft. The first thing is that we etch a 16 digit VIN number, a vehicle identification number. And after we do that, we actually go one extra step and we mark it marked by LAPD. So as we emblazon that with a spray paint and a template, this is meant to be a visual deterrence. So if somebody sees it, they can think twice, do I really want to take it? And if you're in possession, you're going to have a difficult time having to explain why are you in possession of that item. Our next event is going to be a 100 Toyota Prius event. Toyota Priuses are the number one stolen vehicle and the number one targeted vehicle for catalytic converter theft. That's going to be on September 22nd in Griffith Park. You can always check us out at LAPD.com for our information and at our Twitter and our Facebook is LAPD Northeast. You can always call us at the LAPD Northeast station to get information. September 22nd, 100 Toyota Prius at the wonderful, historic Griffith Park. As Friends of Elysian Park, we're a volunteer organization, a nonprofit that looks out for Elysian Park. We're basically stewards of Elysian Park that coordinate events and projects with the Department of Rec and Parks and with the Dodgers, who are sponsoring this parking lot for the LAPD. 
to um, do VIN etching because people are getting their catalytic converters stolen. It's a win-win situation. They're, the police department is doing this for free for anybody who brings their car here. The Black Business Association founded its Black Business Day 36 years ago when Tom Bradley was mayor of Los Angeles. This year's celebration of Black Business Day had an added empowerment fair which brought the crowds to Council District 10. Today we are right on 10th Avenue in the 10th District and we are celebrating Black Business Day. This is a day that is 36 years in the making because the Black Business Association's longest serving president, Earl Skip Cooper, had the foresight to start the tradition 36 years ago when Mayor Tom Bradley first declared Black Business Day. Through the pandemic, we had a surge of black businesses that started up or either it pivoted, increased, and changed and, and started things where they're doing more in the entrepreneurial way. And we're looking to support them, to build their capacity, to co collaborate more with other businesses and find those opportunities. We can't wait till next year when it's even bigger. This is our inaugural empowerment fair, and we're gonna continue this as an annual event every third Saturday in the month of August, which is also Black Business Month. Official support for the unhoused is a crucial source of assistance. What if instead of taking to the streets, the support teams were all accessible in one place? That's the idea at work in Council District 13, which hosted a one-stop shop for homeless support. Today we're here at Edendale Library, right in the heart of Echo Park, and we are doing a Connect Day that, rather than bringing the different providers out into the community, one by one with the unhoused community, we bring them all in one space and they can come to us. It's much more efficient. We build relationships of trust, uh, and I think uh, you know it'll help us actually solve the homelessness crisis. Navigating the homeless services system is really difficult, even for myself. So I can only imagine for someone experiencing homelessness, not having the right resources or knowing where to go. The council members and their offices, they know the community, they know what resources are needed. So for them to be able to pull these specific agencies and know what is really best to serve the community is one of like the best um, things about having this collaboration together. folks want to get a shower, uh, they can get it. Folks need a telephone, we have someone doing that. We have hygiene kits, uh, we have PATH, we have SELA who do uh, homeless services, CalFresh if they want to get uh, you know, access to, to good food. Uh, they can all come here and, and be connected to all those services. The more of these we have, the more consistent we are, the better trust we have with our homeless community and the more folks that we can serve overall. The system can touch more individuals as we continuously do this. So I, I think it's very important. If you are experiencing homelessness or you know someone that is experiencing homelessness in your community and you don't know what next steps to take, um, there is a website called LA Hop. that's la-hop.org. That's one other way we're able to make those connections. If it's summer, it must be time for a getaway. And that's what Camp Wesson is all about. Children from Council District 10 get to head into the Hollywood Hills for a few days of fun in the sun. This is our district office right here at the Tom Bradley Center on Pico in the 10th District. And today we have children from all over the 10th District headed up to Camp Hollywood Land for three days in the sunshine and the fresh air to do arts and crafts and sports and bonding. So it's really exciting. Parents are here. We all have our camp shirts on and every day it's color coded so the kids have orange for today and blue another day and then they're gonna do tie dye on Saturday so that's their go home shirt, part of their art project. So it's arts, crafts, everything fun. 
staff went out into our neighborhood councils and shared the flyers so that parents could come in and feel like this is a trusted resource. So staff knows many of the parents because they met with them when they're in the community. And that, that made the parents feel comfortable. Hey, I know John, he works in CD10. Okay, I'll bring my kids there. Herb Wesson started this in 2006. So that's why we named it Camp Wesson, because it's named after him. He felt like kids in the tent needed an opportunity to get out in the fresh air. And so we're just carrying on the tradition. This is my first year, but I'm really excited about what this is gonna be. People should know is that this is Rec and Parks, that they don't realize that this is part of the city family. And I really want to thank Rec and Parks for this experience for the children of the 10th District, because this is exposure, let other folks know that this is available, and that we're utilizing some of the wonderful places the city has to offer. The city buys the Mayfair Hotel to house the homeless. There are some new rules on what goes in the blue bin, and it's time for city artists to apply for cultural grants. These stories up next on City Beat. LA's Department of Sanitation and Environment provides collection services to over 750,000 households and collects an average of 800 tons of recyclable materials every day. Now LA Sanitation has new rules for plastic recycling and wants you at home to know before you throw. Effective immediately, only plastic containers marked one, two, or five can be placed in the blue recycling bins. Typically, soda and water bottles are a one. Laundry soap, milk jugs, lotion, and shampoo bottles are a two. And retail food containers such as yogurt, butter, or margarine tubs are a five. Always check the number because placing non-recyclable plastic in the blue bin contaminates the whole bin and actually creates more waste. For more information, contact LA Sanitation at lacitysan.org. LA City Council has approved a proposal by Mayor Karen Bass to buy the Mayfair Hotel for $83 million as part of the city's Inside Safe initiative. The Mayfair will become part of LA City's permanent interim housing and in its first two years will primarily serve people from Skid Row. Under city ownership, the Mayfair will provide its residents with on-site services, including medical, mental health, and substance abuse treatment providers. Renovations to the Mayfair Hotel will cost around $22 million and the operating costs of the new facilities are expected to be in the region of $5 million per annum. Plans for the Mayfair are still in development. For more information, go to mayor.lacity.gov. LA's Department of Cultural Affairs, DCA, welcomes applications for its current cultural grants program in amounts up to $80,000. Artistic and cultural projects will be considered from nonprofit organizations whose main purpose is in arts and cultural services. DCA will also consider proposals from organizations who will partner with experts to present outdoor events or city parades. Organizations applying for a grant must be headquartered in Los Angeles, have some arts experience, and events must serve people within the city boundaries. Applicants are encouraged to liaise with the Department of Cultural Affairs before filing their proposals by the September 8th deadline. DCA offers five grant opportunities each year to artists or arts organizations. For more information, go to culturela.org. It's a community building collaboration between the Mayor's Office, LA Parks, and Gang Reduction and Youth Development. Summer Night Lights is also about fun, as Green Meadows Recreation Center shows us. Welcome to Green Meadows! Green Meadows Recreation Center, home of Summer Night Lights. This is a collaborative program that's put together in conjunction with LA City Recreation and Parks, the Mayor's Office, and the Grid Office. Every summer, our park stays open until 11 p.m. at night. I have two children and two grandchildren. 
So I actually bring all four of them at different times. This park is very safe. I feel very comfortable leaving my children here when they come to activities. The staff is amazing. It's really a treasure for the city. This program has been awesome this summer. We've had all different types of sports here. We've had soccer, as you can see behind me. We've had basketball, indoors and outdoors. There is food. Thank you. Thank you. There is fun. And at the end, everyone will receive a medal for their participation. And everything is absolutely free. So right now, we're wrapping up our summer programming for Summer Night Lights. It has been absolutely amazing. We hate to see everyone go back to school, but we know that it's necessary. They'll miss having some place to play in the evening time, coming out to the park at night when it's nice and warm. But I mean, we look forward to the fall programming. So for more information about our programs here, you can go to laparks.org. When the temperatures are on the rise, LA's Climate Emergency Mobilization Office has advice, updates, and resources for everyone to stay cool. Staying protected against the effects of extreme heat could be life-saving. Extreme heat is LA's primary climate hazard and the one that we know causes the most deaths and hospitalizations. Who is most at risk? Outdoor workers people who are active outdoors, infants and children, pregnant women and elders, people with chronic illness such as asthma, heart disease and diabetes. So what, what do you wanna do? You want to prepare by staying cool and hydrated. And if you feel too hot, you have to go somewhere cool and rest um, like a cooling center. You wanna wear light clothing. You want to ensure that you take cold showers, avoid direct sunlight, drink more water and stay hydrated. Pets are more sensitive to extreme heat than humans because they don't sweat. We want to make sure then that we keep them in a, in a cool place all day long and that they have access to plenty of water. We also don't want to walk them outdoors when it's super hot because their paws can burn. The Department of Aging and the Department of Disability provide special services for those constituents, so if you need air conditioning or if you need other medical equipment or your refrigerator breaks down and that's where your medicine is, please call the Department of Aging or Department of Disability and you can find them through 311 and they will help you make sure that you have all of the resources you need to stay healthy and to stay safe. Go to our website climate4la.org and we have lots of great information like our Cool Spots LA app that tells you where all the cooling centers are, where the hydration centers are, um, and other resources that the city has been investing in to keep our community safe. For more cool tips, head to climate4la.org. Los Angeles Public Library's newest branch building reflects its Silver Lake location both inside and out. The library is the center of the neighborhood and the building itself was locally designed. We are the newest branch in the LAPL library system. We opened in 2009. That makes us almost 14 years old. The architect that we chose lived in the neighborhood and he really wanted the branch to reflect the history of the neighborhood. He really was very careful about making sure that the inside and outside spaces all work together. So we have a lot of glass. In fact, we have some special glass called channel glass. We also have a large reading room that is all glass and looks out on the neighborhood on our front courtyard. So it is really reflective branch of the neighborhood that it resides in. So Silver Lake was one of the newest libraries and when it was built in 2009 we got the newest technology which is called RFID, that's radio frequency IDs and it lets patrons check out their materials all by themselves with these special antennas. We also are a LEED certified green building which means a lot of the materials and design of our engineering systems are certified as being green. 
Another wonderful thing that we have is the Baby Grand Piano up in the front of the library. It's a beautiful space, it makes beautiful sound, and we've really been able to connect our musical community with our collections here at the library. And this branch in particular really is a meeting place. We have community meetings that meet here, friends come, meet up. It really is the geographic center and the cultural center of our community. The March on Washington demonstrated the need for social change and marked 100 years of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, LA's Board of Public Works commemorates the 60th anniversary of the march. I would simply like to say that I think this has been one of the great days of America. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. Today we are so proud to celebrate and commemorate the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington, which was formerly called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. It happened 60 years ago. It was the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation when African Americans were free. The 13th Amendment said that there was an end to slavery, which represented freedom. And that 100-year check-in was named the March on Washington. So today, we're very proud to historically acknowledge it and what it meant to our country. Being in Los Angeles, uh, we were often referred to as a free state still had individuals who came to California with their slaves. In our remembrance, we realized that a lot has changed, but little has changed. It's like an oxymoron. And so we have to continue to fight. We have to continue to make sure that those goals are still met today. With the tenor in America today, there's a lot that's going on. There's a lot that's happening that's taking us back. So we have to engage again in that fighting spirit to say, look, justice, jobs, all of that is very important today as it was 60 years ago. All of these challenges we have in life are the kinds of things that we must overcome. And I think America still is the greatest country on earth. So we hope today, as we share what happened 60 years ago, that young people can have a great appreciation of the things that were done for us to enjoy what we enjoy today. The U.S. is reminded it is not enough to hope together, to pray together. She is reminded she must speak and act for the common good. In our feature story, Nisei Week celebrates the Japanese community and culture in L.A. and brings thousands of people into Little Tokyo. David Yamahara, president of Nisei Week, and Kaylee Namiko Chu, this year's Nisei Week queen, talk to our Maria Hallbrown about the growth and impact of Nisei Week. Well, it began in 1934 in the middle of the Depression in order to help celebrate and support Japanese American communities here in Los Angeles. And now it's blossomed into a remarkable festival, the Nisei Week Japanese Festival here in LA. And I'm delighted to be joined by this year's president, David Yamahara, and this year's queen, Caitlin Amiko Chu. So nice to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you. Why is the festival at large important to the Japanese American community here in Los Angeles? The biggest thing is for, for us to meet our mission, which is to uh, share the Japanese and Japanese heritage and traditions with the diverse communities of Southern California. And we really stress the diverse communities because it's not just for Japanese, Japanese Americans, it's for anybody that wants to have the opportunity to see about the traditions and the culture of the Japanese.
how important was Japanese culture to you growing up as a Nisei? Yes. So for me, I'm half Japanese, half Chinese, and that is an identity that I'm super proud of. I would say that getting involved in the Japanese American community started when I was very young. I would go to different events here in Little Tokyo, and it just means a lot to me. It means being involved in a very strong and vibrant community. It means honoring our values and our traditions, and I'm just really honored to be here this year to continue that. As a president, they're my court. Uh, I've adopted seven new daughters uh, uh, for the year in and hopefully beyond that. And if people want to learn more about uh, Nisei Week, you know, whether they're seeing this while it's going on or whether they've just missed it or they want to participate next year or if they want to really want to help you yes. in a number of ways, what's the best way for them to learn about this wonderful festival? And thank you for asking, Maria, because uh, we're always looking for volunteers, supporters, uh, new sponsors, and so forth. And they can find more information on our website. That's uh, niseweek.org. In this week's Things to Do, more than 500 music acts will perform at Echo Park Rising. George Geary talks about the history of California foods and iconic restaurants. And the second annual Barbara Morrison Jazz and Blues Festival will celebrate her legacy. All this up next on Things to Do. Don't miss the return of Echo Park Rising, the festival that celebrates the creative residents and businesses of Echo Park. Named Best Music Festival by LA Weekly, Echo Park Rising combines performances, art, music, and food in a lively street fair, which is free to attend and for all ages. Presented by Echo Park Chamber of Commerce, more than 500 music acts will be on stages, at bars and restaurants, at businesses, and outdoors throughout the neighborhood. Echo Park Rising returns to Echo Park on Saturday, September 9th, starting at 8 a.m. and continuing all day. Log on to epr.la for more information. Learn more about California foods and iconic restaurants with food expert George Geary, author of 15 books including Made in California and LA's Landmark Restaurants. From fast food locations that began in SoCal to historical restaurants, these are the places that started new trends and impacted the eating habits of the nation. This informative lecture will transport you to some of our most loved and venerable food establishments. Join George Geary for the History of California Foods and Iconic Restaurants on Saturday, September 9th at 10.30 a.m. in L.A. Central Library. Log on to lapl.org slash events for more information. Attention jazz and blues lovers, don't miss the second annual Barbara Morrison Jazz and Blues Festival. Celebrate the late jazz icon on what would have been her 74th birthday at the annual music festival named in her honor. See a lineup of performances from the likes of Eloise Laws and Barbara Morrison's band, originally the Boo Crew Band. You'll also hear local musicians, singers, and DJs with guests dropping in during the day. The Barbara Morrison Jazz and Blues Music Festival is free and takes place at the Barbara Morrison Performing Arts Center in Lamert Park on Saturday, September 9th. For more details, visit tbmpac.com. And that's a look at some things to do. And that's all for this edition. I'm Natalia Bilbao, and from all of us here at LA This Week, thank you so much for joining us. You can watch us online anytime at LACityView.org, and we're also on Instagram, Facebook, X, and YouTube. See you next time for more LA This Week. Mm -hmm.